what is up you guys so in this one we'll be talking about something really interesting and especially if you're implementing an algorithm that aims at solving a certain optimization problem and it is the certificate of suboptimality or epsilon suboptimal so with that said most algorithms that aim at optimizing a certain problem operate in an iterative fashion whether you're minimizing or maximizing in a certain feasible region, it's most probably going to be iterative. Simplex is iterative in a sense that candidate or pivot points jump from one edge on the polyhedron to another in order to maximize or minimize the linear cost. Dual simplex is likewise, but interior point methods that are also iterative in nature. The gradient and steepest descent methods are also iterative in a way that they update a point based on a given direction that is computed through the gradient of the cost or the Lagrangian function. So yeah, many algorithms are iterative in nature and because of that, we should be able to know when to stop, right? So this lecture is dedicated for this purpose and I'll be showing you a non-heuristic way through the epsilon suboptimal inequality on when to stop. So the question is, given at each iteration, your value x and the Lagrangian pairs, lambda and nu, we can actually get a really nice non-heuristic bound on when to stop. So epsilon over here is a given precision. So stop after one decimal point, stop when there's no changes up to one decimal point, two decimal points, and so on, okay? So yeah, so without further ado, let's get started on epsilon epsilon suboptimality. Right, so any optimization problem, whether convex or not, looks like this. So we're minimizing a certain function f0 of x subject to some inequality constraints and some equality constraints where let's say we've got, I don't know, p of those, okay? Um, so this is the problem we have and in this lecture will be actually talking about something very interesting i find and it's something called the certificate of suboptimality so before going into optimality conditions that are the kkt and complementary slackness um we're going to you know highlight some topics on suboptimality as a reminder associated to any optimization problem there's the lagrangian function right it's a function of your variables and your lagrangian Grangian variables, right? So basically it's your cost augmented by a weighted sum of your inequality constraints and a weighted sum of your equality constraints, right? And, you know, as we mentioned previously, there is also something called the Lagrangian dual function or simply the dual function that is denoted by g and it is independent of the variables x and the reason why is because you take the minimum or the infimum with respect to x of the Lagrangian function. So naturally after, you know, you find the infimum of this guy with respect to x then you plug it back in and you'd get a function that is independent of that okay so let's say you you're doing some i don't know computer simulations you're implementing a certain optimization algorithm right and basically your algorithm is dealing with this guy the dual function okay well it turns out that many numerical algorithms actually test lambdas and nu's. So what do we mean by test? Well, for a given lambda and nu, we want to see how good we're doing. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you have a certain algorithm, I don't know, written in, I don't know, any language you prefer. Um, so this is your algo. And your algorithm takes in F0, all your Fi's, right? As well as your H's. And what this algorithm basically does is, whether it's steepest descent or newton raphson or whatever type of algorithm you're implementing what this algorithm should return is an estimate of the optimal solution denoted let's say by x star okay so this problem is optimal at x star and this algorithm returns an estimate of x star okay let's say x star hat right so there's a bunch of math going on over here and it finally returns 
X star hat. Okay, good. Well, one might ask how good of an estimate is X star hat, right? So what happens here is while you're testing your algorithm, you know, you test it on multiple optimization problems. And thus, let's say you know beforehand the optimal value of the function. So you know P star, for example, P star is actually F zero of X star, okay? Just for testing sake, right? just for testing sake. In general, of course, you don't know it. That's what you're trying to estimate. But for the moment, let's say you have access to this guy. Well, one criterion of seeing how good of an optimal value you have over here is to see how far P star is from the Lagrangian dual function. So in other words, let's say this X star hat is associated with lambda star hat, right? And new star hat, okay? Well, let's say this algorithm returns all three. The last two are optional, but how you can measure how good X star hat is, is by the distance between P star and G evaluated at those Lagrangian values, right? So in other words, what we can see here is that this pair, lambda and mu, provide something called a proof or certificate, as Boyd puts it in his book, on this pair. And the closer this guy is, the P star, the better of a job you're doing. So in other words, when you have strong duality, you will have arbitrarily good certificate. So with that said, keeping that in mind, those dual points, those dual feasible points actually give us an idea on how suboptimal of a job we're doing. So, okay, so a way to test it, your algorithm is to see this gap between P star and G lambda star and mu star. Um, well, now let's say you're in a situation where you do not know P star, right? This you do not know, which is reality. In reality, you do not have access to this guy. Well, we know that in general, this holds true, right? So if I do this, multiply by minus on both sides, I get this, right? So I'm just inverting this sign. And on both sides, I'm going to add my cost. So it is back here. I'm just going to add F zero of X on both sides, okay? So this is true for any, you know, for any X. And what we're interested here is to find how far is F zero of X from P star. Well, we can get an idea from this bound over here. And in particular, when you evaluate this function at your final estimate X star hat, what you'll get is this, right? So I'm just evaluating at X star hat, of course. So notice that this guy, which is our, you know, evaluation criterion is upper bounded by this guy, right? And this guy, we actually have access to because once you estimate X star hat, then you can easily estimate F zero of X star hat. And likewise, you can also estimate your dual function at the Lagrangian pairs. So what I mean to say is that if this guy in the extreme case, if it's zero or something really small, then we could be sure that this bound over here, F zero X star hat minus P star is also small. Let's say this upper bound is bounded by epsilon, right? Okay. So you manage to, I don't know, to reach a stage of your, I don't know, maybe iterative algorithm where it's always the case that this difference, let's say an absolute value, I'll apply an absolute value here. You reached a stage in your algorithm where this is always upper bounded by a precision parameter or a given threshold. So I might as well go back to the algorithm here, right? And you know, I'll add one input that is epsilon. And that's what you find in most optimization algorithms, right? Your one important input is the precision that you would like, right? Um, let's say you want a solution up to the order of two decimal places. I don't know. So all those are reflected in epsilon. The smaller this is, a more precise estimate you'll get, but it will take more time because <laughs> you'd end up running a lot of iterations here to reach the desired precision. Well, one way of measuring precision in optimization problems is from this inequality. So back to this inequality, we can measure at each iteration F zero X star hat minus G lambda star mu star, right? We have access to those. Actually, 
x star, lambda, and mu are computed at each iteration of the algorithm. And hence, we can just compute this difference and see if it's less than a certain epsilon. If it is, then we're sure that our cost function evaluated at the estimated x star, right, is also bounded by epsilon. In this case, we say that we have an epsilon suboptimality. So let's be more specific here. Let's say your algorithm that takes in F0, F1, Fm, and your Hs, as well as epsilon, operates, I don't know, over, let's say, a loop. There's a loop over here. So 4k going from 1 till maybe uppercase n. So over here, you're doing some you're doing your algorithm. Let's say you're doing a steepest or gradient descent or a certain Newton type algorithm. Or the idea here is that you're computing some stuff at each iteration and you're getting x at iteration k from a certain equation. I don't know. Let's say equation one. And you're also getting at this iteration lambda k as well as new k right from possibly another equation equation two whether it's steepest gradient i don't know what it's it's really algorithm dependent so you're doing this stuff and actually there, there shouldn't be an n here because we just said um there's an epsilon here that determines when this guy should stop right so for this 4k going from 1 to n, I'll just replace it with a while not stop, okay? So we're still running. And that's the next part of the discussion. It's when to stop. So it's all thanks to this gap over here, this inequality over here, that gives us an idea or a criterion when to stop. So it's actually, there's many, many heuristic stopping criterions in the field of optimization. So say maybe stop after some number of iterations or i don't know what no this inequality actually it's not a heuristic stopping criterion it, it comes from the from the weak duality gap it's a duality gap right we started off from this b star is greater than g of lambda nu which is true whatever the case right or going back down here we got this and this is true for any x or lambda nu for a given problem. So based on this observation, you can go ahead and just terminate when, so I'll remove this. You can go ahead here and check on a certain inequality, right? Which is this, which is what we said. So you can go ahead at each iteration and check is f0 of x k, right? Minus the Lagrangian dual here evaluated at lambda star and nu star. But in this case, it's k because at step k, this is what we have, right? And go ahead and check if this guy absolute value is less than epsilon, okay? If so, then stop is true, okay? So this is actually telling us that you're, you're guaranteed to stop when you're epsilon epsilon suboptimal okay, based on this criterion. So what people refer to the Lagrangian pair is a certificate. So it's actually telling you that we are epsilon good. We are epsilon close to the optimal value right from the extreme lower bound. So if you set epsilon to 0.1, okay, then at some point of your iterations, given that you initialize correctly, the algorithm is not bad, right? There's some algorithms that do not converge because they're bad. And there's other algorithms that, that are really sensitive to initialization conditions. Um, that's another thing. We'll probably be talking about this in future lectures, but for the moment, just bear in mind that, uh, so given an epsilon 0.1, let's say over here, and given that your algorithm is converging, it's going to converge eventually, then if you reach this epsilon suboptimality stage, then you're sure that also this extreme lower bound is also upper bounded by epsilon 0.1, right? So what does that mean? It, it simply means that if this is P star in, in an n-dimensional space, let's say in this case in a 2D space, then this is your P star and you draw a circle around P star of radius epsilon, then guess what? F0 of X star falls inside the circle. This is what it, it actually means. In our case here, it would be XK, right? So 
once the epsilon suboptimality inequality is satisfied, that means F0 of xk lies inside a circle, if you're in 2D, centered at p star and radius epsilon. Oh, and by the way, I should have drawn a, a line segment because all the optimization problems we're talking about um, are mapping F0 of x onto one dimension. So x is n-dimensional, okay, but F0 of x is one-dimensional, right? I drew a circle because <laughs> I was thinking about multi-criterion optimization. So in this case, F0 of x is no longer only a scalar, as we talked in previous lectures, it's a vector. So in vector optimization or multi-criterion optimization, you're, you're going to have to draw a circle to explain what you're doing, to explain the epsilon suboptimality. Otherwise, in a simple convex optimization problem, you draw a line segment and this is your p star and you'd say oh i am within this um this is epsilon over here so is this so f0 of k would fall here okay this is in 1d in a traditional convex optimization problem and this is for vector optimization problems now one question over here that is really interesting and if you really open books you might not see this absolute value over here so what does that mean for an epsilon positive it means that f0 of x star is always greater than p star right that's that's i mean that's what you're doing you're minimizing f0 so you're trying to pull it down to p star but what if what if your f, what if you're in this region over here, right? Your f of x behaves as such, right? Let's say it, it does this. This is a minimum and, and this is your f0 of x star, right? What if you were looking outside the feasible region? What if you were popping outside? Now, if, if, if your algorithm is implemented in a way that you're always operating inside here, then you could just you know easily drop those absolute values because you're sure that f0 of x k right is always greater than g of lambda but what if you just you know for some reason of the algorithm you started outside the feasible set so in in such cases you can you can just drop the absolute values and go okay okay so that's about it for this lecture we talked about certificate of suboptimality so with that said given an optimization problem and an algorithm that tries to solve the problem the question is when do we stop so we're iterating over and over again to improve the qualities of the estimates of xk of x as we saw here x at iteration k f x superscript k and lambda superscript k and new superscript k so that's what you're you're computing at each iteration and the question is again when to stop well one interesting and non-heuristic stopping criterion would be just to look at the distance between the cost function and the Lagrangian dual function and to see if this is less than a given precision. And the reason why I say it's non-heuristic is because it's based on the epsilon suboptimality inequality, the one you see here. It is based off the dual gap. Thank you for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please hit the like button. Also consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can leave a comment down in the comment section below. I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Thank you so much and I'll see you in future lectures.